us tonight to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. You know, when our pastor came here, he was just a young man. And still a young man. But I want you to know that he's growing, he's maturing. And as a sign of his growing and maturing, tonight they got old Jim signing up for tea off. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 10. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained or prepared, that we should walk in them. Like we read that first scripture. For we are his workmanship, created Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained or prepared, that we should walk in them. Father, we thank you for this day, for what you care for us, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Father, for all you've done for us. We ask Father you in church tonight, Lord, your will be done. In Christ's name, amen. As I was thinking about this verse of Scripture, and Paul was here talking about grace and faith, I did to think about trees and how much I love trees. You know, trees are essential for the world we live in. Trees are one of the biggest sources for oxygen. We all have to have oxygen to breathe. Trees are a source of food for man and for the uh, animals of the forest. They're a shelter for the animals of the forest. And what person doesn't appreciate a big shade tree on a cold, uh, pardon me, on a hot summer day? You know, when it's hot, the big outside, there's something about a shade tree that you go sit under it to cool you out. Trees are beneficial. When they're soft, better, we can die a natural death. We can take the lumber and make many of the things you see here in the church, returning your home. So the lumber is used for many things. Even the, the sawdust and chips of the trees are used for various uh, wood products. Trees. That die in the forest for any time. I take it in, but uh, several people, including myself, to burn as wood for fuel for, to heat you up in the wintertime. So trees are very beneficial. Trees produce something. Tonight I talk to you about what salvation will produce. What salvation will produce. Christians should produce just like that's true. Christians should be beneficial just like a tree. The sad fact that many churches are across the nation today, there are Christians, there are people sitting in the church that never produce anything. A person that claims to be saved, a person that claims to be in the center of God's will, a person that claims to be following the Lord as their uh, Lord saying they're a master. But yet they never produce anything. Now I don't know about you, but I have a problem when I see a person that claims to be a Christian and they never produce anything. And I might be judgmental, but the Bible says you can take the Bible and under the fruits, you shall know them. By the works, by their deeds, by their actions, you shall know. You can know what kind of person that person is. An apple tree, for instance, produces apples. A pear tree produces pears. A peach tree produces peaches. And one of my favorite trees I know produces acorns. That's really beneficial for squirrels and grouse and deer and turkey. And I keep on going. But they produce something. They're beneficial. But tonight we say we're saved. And we're not producing, we're not benefiting anyone else in the church or the church family. Then I ask you a question. What benefit are we tonight? What really good or serve, what purpose do we have in the life or in the church, in the church family? Salvation tonight, I submit to you according to God's word, will 
produce something in your life. If you're saved tonight, then there will be some evidence of salvation. If you're saved tonight, there will be, will be some signs in your life that are going to let the world know that you're saved. Now, which of the signs in your life are going to tell the world that, hey, I'm different. I come out of the world, the system, and the worldly things, and I'm living apart to Christ. you talk to a person for a few minutes, we should be able to tell whether that person is a Christian or whether they're not a Christian. Our spirit, God said our spirit will bear witness with them if they're a Christian. But when I go into the store or into where I may be and begin to talk to a person, it doesn't take very long. I like to study people. It doesn't take very long to figure out what kind of person that person really is. Now, I'll be to you sometimes I get fooled. But really, by being around a person for quite some time, you can tell what kind of person that is. They are. So I submit to you again tonight, salvation will produce something in your life. First of all, the person that's true to say, salvation will produce a clean conscience. Salvation will produce a clean conscience. In Hebrews 13 18, it says, A conscience that is good. A conscience that is good. You know, when I was a person of the world, I was lost, but I was a boy. The thoughts that I had, the conscience that I had, wasn't necessarily a good conscience. Many times the attitude I had toward other people was not good. But when Christ came into my life and I was saved, something happened. So transpired in my life. And God took away the old conscience that was evil and corrupt and vile and wicked. And Christ gave me a conscience that was good. A conscience that felt good for other people and had good thoughts and ideas about other people. And we are sitting here tonight we still have the same old evil feelings towards other people. We have the same old evil attitudes for other people. Then I don't question about my salvation. I don't question your salvation tonight. If you don't have a good conscience toward other people. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it talks about a conscience that's purged by the blood of Christ. Can you imagine tonight that we say we're saved? And yet we continue on the way we're continuing on before when the precious blood of Christ has been applied to life. The darling Son of God that came and gave his life. For you and for me. That precious blood that was shed across the Calvary. Christ was one who loved people when he came upon that river. In fact, when Christ went about his, the Bible said he came to seek the saviors which were lost. When he came in contact with a lame, he healed him. When he came in contact with a blind, he, he healed him. When he came in contact with those who were deaf, he healed him. Many diseases Christ came in contact with, he did only good. You see the blood that was emanating from the life of Christ. So that blood had been applied to my life and your life as a Christian. So that life should be, should perk away all the evil and the sin in our lives and give us a new conscience toward our fellow man. A clean conscience will produce a conscience without a fence, according to Acts 24, verse 16. Now think about that tonight. Again, when we were sinners out in the world, we didn't particularly care who we offended. We didn't particularly care who we came in contact with and what we said to them on many occasions. But since we became Christians, I don't want to do, and you should not want to do anything that would offend one of God's children. Think about a child tonight. They're born into innocence. They're born into a life that knows no evil. But it doesn't take long to get to learn some evil things from those in it. They take a while to start seeing the evil things in the world. But that child is born into innocence. And when we're born again, beloved, we should become like a child. I said we need to go become like a child. And we have this thing instant about us. And try to live a life that's without a fear toward our brothers and sisters.
us is to Christ toward the world. So salvation will produce a clean conscience. Number two, salvation will produce a clean mind. In Philippians 2 5, the Bible says a mind is patterned after the life of Christ. A mind that's patterned after the life of Christ. Can you imagine Christ when he walks here on the earth, going to some place we go to, saying some things we say, doing some things that we do? I cannot visualize, I cannot imagine uh, uh, my Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, having a mind that was upon the worldly things that you will face this world. So it behooves me tonight to have a, a Christian, to have a mind that's patterned after the mind of Christ. Again, in Romans 12, 2, it talks about a mind that's, talks about a mind that's not conformed to this world. A mind that's not conformed to this world. When I was saved, when you were saved, many times we were running with the wrong crowd. We are involved in the wrong things, going to the wrong place we said before. We want to be popular on many occasions. We want to be with our friends. But when Christ came into my life, I felt like I could no longer conform to the things that my friends were doing. I no longer go to the places they want to. I no longer hang with that old crowd because they were only involved in, uh, involved in the worldly things. But in a Christian, I was involved in spiritual things. I was a forsake or turn away from the worldly things and put my mind upon the, upon the, the Christ that has saved me. It saved him in one seven. The Bible says, uh, uh, salvation produced a spirit without fear. A spirit without fear. I've told you before how before I got saved that many times I lay in bed at night and I'm worried and I think about time. I knew where I was going to go. I knew I didn't have Christ for my personal sake. I knew that the wrath of God abided on me as a lost person. But tonight, my love, I can lay right to get on the floor and I go to sleep without that fear, without that worry. Because I know I'm saved. You see, salvation can be assured. Salvation can be confidence that all is well with my soul. You know, I don't worry tonight about should someone break in my house and do me harm. I don't worry tonight about the house burning down and do me harm. I don't worry about what the world can do to me because I know in whose hands I am in. I'm in the Lord's hand. And I know nothing can happen to me, nothing will set me, nothing can come upon me without the Lord unless to happen. So I no longer have that fear. And that's what salvation has done for me. It's what salvation will do for you as a Christian. So salvation will produce a clean conscience. A salvation will produce a clean mind. And thirdly, salvation produces a clean heart. In Matthew 5, 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart. The clean, the pure heart. Wouldn't it be wonderful tonight if all people had a pure heart? One of us free from all the vile being things in this world. There'll be no more war. There'll be no more fighting. There'll be no more famine squabbling. There'll be no more uh, feuding within the church. There'll be a lot of things that cease if only had a pure mind and clear conscience from God. In the Psalms, in Psalm 97, verse 11, uh, that clean heart will produce uh, is an upright heart. An upright heart. There was a time when my heart was right with God. There was a time when you, when you were lost out of sin, your heart was right with God. I asked you tonight, do you know that your heart is in tune with God? Do you know that your heart is right with God tonight? 
Then Psalm 57, verse 7, the psalm says, A heart is fixed on the Lord. A heart is fixed on the Lord. I tell you, I love my wife tonight. I love my family. I love my church. I love my church family. Y'all are the one I love more than I love my wife, my family, my church, my church family. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. My heart, my mind is fixed upon the Lord tonight of what God wants for me in my life. Can you call me and say tonight that your, your mind, your heart is fixed upon the Lord and you do what the God wants you to do with your life? I know beyond a shadow of doubt tonight that I want what God wants me to do. I do what God wants me to do. Because I have a peace and satisfaction that only can come when we know we're in of God's will. We're doing God's, what God wants to do. There was a time in my life, I'm sure there was a time in your life when you knew you were what God wants you to do. You were done with what God wants you to do. You didn't have that peace. You didn't have that assurance. It only come to a, a heart that's fixed up on the Lord. All about a clean conscience, a clean mind, a clean heart. Then fourthly, salvation produces a clean mouth. In James chapter 1, Verse 26, James talks about the tongue. The low tongue. A powerful tool is the tongue. The problem with the most powerful tools you have is the tongue. Nations can be wrecked because of the tongue. Homes can be wrecked because of the tongue. Churches can be wrecked because of the tongue. Lives can be wrecked because of the tongue. When someone has a problem, or we can go out and gossip about that problem, or we use that tongue to pray for that person, we use that tongue to try to help that person. The tongue, James said, is a powerful tool. But when we have a, a salvation, it will produce a clean mouth. Then, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 50, uh, Chapter 1, verse 15, Peter talks about a mouth that's filled with holy conversation and holy living. A mouth that's filled with holy conversation and with holy living. When you and I go out as church goers, we're going to enter into a mission field. Whether we like it or not, God going to be someone that's going to be looking at our lives. Someone's going to be observing us. And I submit to you tonight that. Now, maybe someone at us outside church doors, the only Bible they'll ever see, the only testimony they'll ever see, the only witness they'll ever have is you. What manner of conversation are you going to have? Are you going to be a person that they will know from your speech that you're a Christian, that you love the Lord? Are we going to be participating in the filthy jokes? Are we going to be in, in criticizing and running someone down? Are we going to be participating in things you should not be participating in, you should walk away from? Just think. That person standing there may never have another witness. You may be the only witness they'll ever have. 1 Peter 1.15 tells me to be, I mean, be like a holy conversation, conversation, holy living. The Paul says in Ephesians 4 29 about talks about a word, about a mouth that speaks words of edification. Words of edification. When's the last time you spoke to someone trying to build a mother? When's the last time you spoke to someone trying to encourage them? When's the last time you talked to someone to try to help them through a problem? That you were there to, to be a show to lean on. We're living in a world that's dying for someone to love. I know you've heard that before. It's an old cliche. But literally, there's people out there that want someone just to be a show to lean on, someone to say a kind of word to, someone to just listen to the problems. And this world is full of problems. If you don't believe it, this is the news tonight and all the problems. There are not very many things that are good on the news now, but you hear the bad thing about all the immorality. All the drugs, all the uh, uh, murders, and all the things that are going on in our society today. How about the men that took the 
three girls who had apostles for ten years. Evil is out there. Evil is all around us. Evil is stalking people today. And people need someone just to be a friend, to, to talk to them, to, to tell them about the love of God. They can share the gospel with them. Salvation produces a clean conscience, it produces a clean mind, it produces a clean heart, it produces a clean mouth. Number five, salvation will produce a clean body. In Romans 12, 1, Paul talks about a living sacrifice. This is where many people today, many Christians have a problem. They want to be saved. They want to go to heaven. They really don't mind coming to church. They really don't mind doing something in church. But when it comes to really giving themselves to God wholly and totally, many people try to hold back something in their lives. But beloved, we can't do that. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, to receive your body a living sacrifice. Or we would not give God our all. You know, if we give God our all, He might cost the mission to you. He might cost the pastor or preach. He might cost me a sense to you. He might cost me to go to the choir. He might cost us to do something we don't particularly want to do. Beloved, we have to present ourselves to God in a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him. Romans 6 13, Paul talks about that by this yielding. A body that's yielded unto God. I thought about the word yield today. I thought about the sign we see along the road. We approach the intersection and see a sign that says yield. They see a sign that says stop and look around and go on cautiously. There are times in our lives where we need to stop. Just stop. And listen to God as He speaks to us. Then we need to pursue Him cautiously. So many times we're rambunctious about doing things. Sometimes we put a mouth in the air before we think. Sometimes we take actions before we think. Sometimes we go out of the world and we do things before we think about what we're doing. When we just stop and yield to the inspiration of the of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we wouldn't have done that. I've done things in my lifetime that I thought I was doing right. I thought I was doing good. But today I regret doing it. I regret some of the words I said sometimes to people. If I just stopped and thought, if I'd yielded for just a few moments, I would have done it. There would have been a hurt in someone's life because I spoke right. We didn't yield to God and His Holy Spirit that leads us to the rest of our lives. Then in Romans, the part of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he talks about a body that is kept under subjection. A body that is kept under subjection. We don't like being subjected to anyone, do we? That's human nature. We don't want anyone telling us what to do. We don't want anyone directing our lives. We don't want anyone in control of our lives. But I speak to you tonight. God is God of our lives. He's our Lord and He's our Master or He's not our Lord. If He's not Master in your life, then you need to take Him to it because he's, if He's not Master in your life, then there's something wrong. Because God demands to be Master in your life. And if God is Master in your life, then you have to subject, uh, sub submit yourself to His will and not your own will. But we live in a selfish society where the I factor enters in. I want this. I want that. I want to do whatever I want to do. But beloved, we as Christians, salvation will produce a, 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 a body that's subject or subjected in subjection to Almighty God. Then number six, salvation will produce a clean association. Hebrews 11, 
times she has forsaken all the assembly of ourselves together. Clean association. How many people I have seen and you have seen come to the altar and make confession of faith? Maybe for a moment they'll leave their old friends or old associations. But after a while, they kind of get back into the old ground. They kind of get back into the old place, the old homes they once uh, uh, frequented. And all too often, when this happens, they're dragged back in into the world. I won't miss your name, but I know y'all know who I'm talking about. Think of one young man made his way to the altar, bowed and gave his heart to the Lord, prayed for a prior repentance. But after a while, the old crowd kept coming around and coming around and coming around. But eventually he started running the old crowd again. Now, where is he? Where is he tonight? I don't know. I saw when he started associating with the wrong people, going back to the old crowd, I saw him begin to lose interest in church. He began to lose interest in reading the Bible. He began to lose interest in talking about the Lord. He began to lose worldly things again. You see, we have to be careful about our association and who we associate with as we become Christians. Because the devil will use every influence and every person that is slow come into your life to turn you down and drag you back out into sin. The devil has a lot of tricks, a lot of snares, and he used every one of them to come at you and try to get you to turn down and drag you back in. In Psalm 119, verse 63, the Bible says, associate with those who fear the Lord. Associate with those who fear the Lord. Now think about that it's true. Associate with those who fear the Lord. The world of the Lord has no fear and no respect of the Lord. One example. When I was a boy growing up, we had what we call the blue laws. The blue law meant the stores did not open on Sunday. They respected the Lord, they respected God's house enough, they did not open on Sunday. Now, we have a liquor store here on the corner. As far as I know, it's open on Sundays. You see how far we have gone backwards? I submit to you as Christians, we need to associate with other Christians who fear the Lord, have the same, have the same goals that we have, the same ideas that the same thoughts that we have, have the same respect for God and God's Word that we have. I'm not fear about what God is going to do to me or He's going to come and do so evil with me. I thought I kind of feel wrong about it. But fear is a reverence of the Lord in this respect. So we need, to, we need to, have to associate with people that have the same reverence and respect of the Lord that we do as Christians. Matthew 5 16 tells us we need to. Uh, they associate with those who glorify the Lord. Those who glorify the Lord. It does me good to come to God's house and be around God's people. It does me good. It builds me up. It edifies me. It gives me a boost to see people come with a smile on their face. You know, we see a lot of laughing and talking in church. And I praise God for that. That's a sign of a healthy family. It's a sign of a family that loves one another. But when I see you come in the door with a smiling face, and many of you give you a hard time because of living. You know, it doesn't do that. When we sing the songs of Zion, that helps me. When we hear the preaching of the Word, that helps me. When we hear the teaching of the Word, that helps me. When we take time to pray for those who have sickness or have problems, that helps me as a Christian. When we take time to glorify the Lord, that helps me. That gives me a boost. That helps me. It enables me to go on a little while longer because I've been.
be able to touch people because I've been glorifying the Lord. I've been lifting up His name. So salvation produces a clean conscience, it produces a clean mind, it produces a clean heart, it produces a clean mouth, it produces a clean body, it produces a clean association. And number seven, the last, it produces a clean path. It will produce a clean path. Think about it tonight. The psalmist said in Psalm 16, verse 11, that God will reveal a path of us. Beloved, we're not going to find that path out here in the world. We're not going to find that path uh, at the supermarket or uh, where we have been. But we'll find that path in God's Word and we'll come together as Christians. God has a plan. God has a, has a purpose for your life tonight. Just like that tree uh, has served a purpose or, or a food for uh, for shelter, for shame, for any other purposes. That tree has a purpose in life. So in a Christian, salvation gives us a purpose in our life. And it behooves each and every one of us to search God's Word, to pray, and give us a seat, and if God reveals His pathway for our lives. Again, I told you, I found my pathway where God was to I know what God wants me to do. There's no doubt in my mind. What God wants me to do. And I'm doing just exactly that. What God wants me to do. But have you found God's pathway for your life tonight? What is God's pathway for you tonight? God has a pathway for each and every one of you tonight. Listen. There are no big jobs with God, and there's no little jobs with God. They're all important. We all come together, we all fit together to make up the body of Christ. But let, if you do nothing more than go out and take your umbrella Sunday morning and hold somebody with a child or have, have somebody in church, you have fulfilled your path for God in your life. If you hold the door open for someone and come to church, you may fulfill the path that God has shown for your life. If you call someone that's sick or shut in, not able to come to church, God can use you in that path for your life. There are many ways that God can use you, but I speak to you, God had a path way for your life. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 105, talks about the light of God's Word. Thy Word, the psalmist said, have I hid my heart. I'm not sin against thee. God gives us a light tonight. A light to go out and shine and illuminate the world. I know you heard missionaries talk about going to countries where they don't have a Bible. I heard read an article one time about a missionary who went in and he had one Bible. And there were so many people with one Bible, they took it to get tired of books out of the Bible to give their people. They trace the Word of God so much that they take just a page and read and reread read that page over and over again just to have a little glimpse of what God's Word has shown. But yet we have multi Bibles in most homes tonight. We have many, many Bibles. We have God's Word available to us. God gave us to take His Word and I put it in our hearts, in our lives, that we can go out and we can take it light and illuminate our lost and find where a dark world be its light. Then the Psalm said in Psalm 23, verse 3, in closing, talks about a pathway of righteousness. A pathway of righteousness. Where's your pathway? Your path tonight leads you in producing something for the Lord. Well, the path you're walking on tonight produces anything at all for the Lord. As a tree produces fruit, shade, protection, many products. We look around 
this book here, this keeps. The tale of the law. Came with three. That tree produced itself. We come there to the end of our life. We come there to the end of our journey. Will God save us? He produced it. My prayer is tonight that God will give us anything. Jack, you produce it. Me time I feel like a failure. Me time I feel like I just yell and lose. But when I get home, I feel expect to hear my Lord say, you produce it something. My prayer is tonight that any person can sell my Lord's will be able to sit When I get home, you hear the Lord say, you produce it something. Salvation, I believe, produces in your life. Let's search our heart. Let's search now what God wants to use our salvation to produce. Let's say it.